Hello, and welcome to Author Fest. This is actually our inaugural Author Fest, and I would like to take a moment to explain what that is. First of all, the idea came to us uh, from the former Chief Executive Officer of Simon & Schuster, Jack Romanos, who has a lot of experience with book festivals, and he thought that it would be a really wonderful idea if we could work with book festivals to bring them authors on demand, people who wouldn't necessarily be able to get out on the road and go to every single book festival that would want them. And so for our first event, our inaugural event, um, I thought who would be uh, authors who would be interesting and relevant to the moment, uh, people who, um, who are contributing to our understanding of the culture and history. And it was very easy for me um, to, uh, to come up with that, uh, that selection. Um, by the way, my name is Jonathan Karp. I am the, uh, the CEO of Simon & Schuster, but just as importantly, I am the editor of Herald by Bob Woodward and Robert Costa. Um, the, uh, the news making uh, first rough draft of history that is going to color our understanding of some of the most tumultuous times in recent American history. And, um, and it is my pleasure to introduce them now. Um, Bob Woodward is an associate editor at the Washington Post where he just celebrated his 50th anniversary. Um, he shared in two Pulitzer Prizes, um, one for his Watergate coverage um, and the other for coverage of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. He has authored 20 national best-selling books, 14 of which have been number one, oh, number one New York Times bestsellers, excuse me, 15 of which, including Peril. That's been, that's been uh, that needs to be updated. Robert Costa is a national political reporter at the Washington Post, where he has worked since 2014. He previously served as, a, as the moderator and managing editor of Washington Week in Review on PBS and as a political analyst for NBC News and MSNBC. He holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Notre Dame and a master's degree from the University of Cambridge. He's from Bucks County, Pennsylvania. And they will be in conversation with Mindy Marquez, um, uh, who joined Simon & Schuster in 2020 as vice president and executive editor after a 30-year career as a journalist. Prior to book publishing, Marquez was publisher and executive editor of the Miami Herald and El Nueva Herald and Florida regional editor for McClatchy. During her tenure, the Miami Herald received two Pulitzer Prizes and was a finalist four times. So um, they're going to talk about Peril. This is a nonpartisan book, a nonpartisan conversation, although I have to say that it has amazed me in the coverage of this book, um, because I was the editor. I know that half of the book is about Joe Biden, but you wouldn't know that from the coverage, and maybe they'll get to that at some point. But anyway, it is an honor to be your publisher. Um, welcome. Thank you for coming. And Mindy, I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, John. And it's really um, a privilege to be uh, able to, to sit tonight with Robert and Bob and talk to you about this uh, incredible, um, the incredible work that you've done. And thank you for everyone who's joining us um, through book fairs across the country. We have questions that we did get from the audience, but I'm probably going to weave them in toward the end, um, Robert and Bob. So um, so first of all, congratulations, um, number one on the New York Times bestseller list, and obviously for very good reason. Um, as John mentioned, this book broke news, and even now, weeks after its release, we're still seeing the repercussions in the daily headlines. Just today, um, we saw that Steve Bannon will face criminal contempt charges for defying the subpoena issued by the House Select Committee. And those subpoenas cited your work in peril. So Robert, I'll start with you. Um, why does the book matter for the committee? It's great to be with you, Mindy. And thank you so much to Jonathan Karp and the whole team at Simon & Schuster for all of their support and for all the book fairs out there and book festivals. I'm, I grew up going to book festivals, still go to book festivals. And so I, I really appreciate your love of reading. And if you have read this book, thank you. Mindy, to answer your question, you see the themes and the reporting from this book resonating today uh, because our book comes as Congress is investigating what actually happened on January 6th. But as we reveal in this book, it's not so much about what happened that day. When Woodward and I began this process, we, we started to dig into January 6th, but then we were sitting down with sources for hours on end. And we realized the story was actually just as much about January 5th and January 4th and January 3rd 
And to your point about Steve Bannon, about December 30th, and that's such a critical crossroads in this story. That's when Bannon talks to Trump on the phone and says, we need to make January 6th a reckoning, pull Pence off the ski slopes in Colorado and start to focus on trying to move this election to the House of Representatives. So, um, you know, in addition to that breaking news, you also broke news about the so-called Eastman memo. And that's a two page document that outlined how Trump and his allies might circumvent the certification of Biden's electoral victory, essentially subvert an American election. Bob, can you talk about why this memo is so crucial? Well, we we focused on it. We got a copy of it and it, it lays out it's really a game plan for a coup. But uh, we we paid attention in depth to how it was used. And uh, it turned out that uh, Mike Lee, a very conservative pro-Trump senator from Utah, uh, investigated the allegations, uh, the suggestion, or actually more than that, that there were alternative slates in the 2020 election. So here is uh, Mike Lee, pro-Trump, uh, very much a supporter, and he sees this memo and he says, wait a minute, alternative slates, why haven't I heard about that? So he sits down and this is one of the realities of life in this country, a senator, sitting senator can get almost anyone on the phone. So he goes around and calls the state legislatures or the legislators, the people running uh, the state uh, what, what is going on in Arizona, Wisconsin, and Georgia, and comes up blank. There's absolutely nothing to support this. And so he went on the floor of the Senate right after uh, January 6th, when they were deciding to certify the Biden vote, and said, there is nothing to this. Lindsey Graham did the same thing, had his counsel investigate and uh, what we found significant was these are the, uh, this is the Trump core. This is not Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, the Democratic leaders, but it's pro-Trump pro people looking very intensely and aggressively at what are the facts here? And there is nothing to support the stolen election theme that Trump is now been touting for about nine or 10 months. I think um, this brings us to the pivotal role of Vice President Pence. And um, you know, we learned through your reporting that Pence actually paid more attention to this memo than we um, perhaps did, you know, first expected. Um, you both reported that you know, he asked Dan Quayle, can I perhaps express sympathy with some of the complainants? Um, so in the end, he did the right thing, and he ended up upsetting both sides of the aisle. You know, Robert, can you can you um, walk us through the key decision points in Pence's deliberations? Sure. That call between Pence and Quayle is such a prism into Pence's own dilemma. As Bob Woodward and I have often talked about behind the scenes, the Pence story alone might one day be a Broadway play because it's so full of distress, agony, drama of a man thrust into history, not only as vice president, but to make a decision about how he is going to handle this. And he turns to someone with a similar profile, probably the only other person in America who can say that they share Pence's profile, conservative Republican from Indiana, vice president of the United States. There's really no one else except Dan Quayle. So he calls him up and you can hear in this scene Pence trying to figure out how to balance the two political power bases in his life. I started covering him over 10 years ago in the House of Representatives. He was a backbencher from Indiana. He used to pull me aside and give me a pithy quote. And I'd say, Congressman, you're pretty good, pretty quick with a quote. He'd go, Bob, don't you know they used to call me Rush Limbaugh on decaf in Indiana? <laughs> That's how I got to know Mike Pence, the congressman who was good with a, a sharp quote. But 10 years later, he's now 
in this position as vice president, the Trump ally, but also that conservative Rush Limbaugh Republican, the conservative constitutionalist and the Trumper. Which way is he going to choose? And it's, it's a winding path. Eventually, he decides to not try to push the election to the House. But what a scene on January 5th when the temptation of power, the presidency, is effectively put on a plate in front of him in the Oval Office when the president points out at the crowd outside on Pennsylvania Avenue, the mob, and says, wouldn't it be cool if they said you had the power? Wouldn't it be cool? Wouldn't you want to change an election? It's right out of Shakespeare. Um, and um, speaking of chilling revelations, I think, um, you know, one of the things that the big takeaway from the book is that this wasn't just our domestic crisis for us. This was an international crisis um, that was uh, playing behind the scenes um, and unbeknownst to the American public. Um, you know, Bob, there was a firewall you, you, you detail in the White House. Um, and your revelations about General, General Milley's actions has provoked a lot of discussion about the propriety of his actions. Um, what, what did you both decide in terms of the appropriateness of what General Milley did? Well, we reported it in depth. What, what's interesting, you have to capture uh, the peril and the sense of crisis Milley felt four days before last year's presidential election, when he learns from intelligence, and he's confirmed this in sworn testimony two weeks ago, he learns that China thinks that we are going to attack them. Uh, and this is the hair trigger moment for anyone in the military, uh, that the other side somehow thinks we're going to attack them. And as we know in history, what happens, somebody, some country that thinks that may strike first, first move, advantage, Pearl Harbor. And so Milley gets on the phone to his back channel contact, General Lee, head of the Chinese military. And this is one of those relationships, a top secret channel, people uh, in the Pentagon and the government knew about it. The public certainly didn't. And Milley says uh, to General Lee, look, we're not going to attack you. You've got to understand. And if, it's almost like somebody talking uh, an associate off the ledge who's going to jump and you will say anything. And he says, and Milley has confirmed this under oath, he said, look, I'm going to be calling you if we are at this moment at the edge of conflict. And we will make sure that it doesn't happen. And uh, we are not at this point. There is no cause for alarm. There is not this tension. And in a very significant way for the national security of this country, General Lee said, oh, okay, I am going to take your word for this. And uh, the crisis abates, but the, the crisis was building all through last year during the campaign. And uh, after the insurrection of January 6th, again, uh, there's intelligence that the Chinese think because of what went on and the, the visual sense of uh, violence at the United States Capitol uh, that the Chinese looked at this and said, oh my God, the United States is gonna collapse. We, and the, the world went on military alert, China, Russia, uh, Iran, and uh, we did not know this publicly at all. And Milley again is on the phone to General Lee saying, no, no, we're not gonna collapse. And in the middle of this, I mean, this is uh, uh, true, uh, my colleague Costa is right, this is Shakespeare, because on the same day, same moment, Nancy Pelosi calls Millie, and we have a transcript in the book of this. It's one of the most vivid interactions between leaders, and Nancy Pelosi, second line for the presidency, says, how can you guarantee me that President Trump, 
who she says is crazy, Millie agrees. Uh, how do we know he won't use nuclear weapons to solidify his position as president to, to stay in office? And uh, it's a very dramatic moment when, I mean, I've never in 50 years seen anything like this where Millie calls the war room personnel from the Pentagon and says, I need your personal oath assurance that you will include me if there is any order from President Trump for military actions or God help us, the use of nuclear weapons. And he puts a cocoon around the process to make sure that uh, the country is protected and uh, it, it was, and he's been criticized. And I think Costa and I looked at this at great length and General Milley's only goal is everything we look at is to protect the country. He realized he had that responsibility as the president's top military person. And, and you, you, you said, um that in many ways, um, General Milley's response really can be traced back to that pivotal moment, um, you know, in the protest over the murder of George Floyd. Can you can you talk about that a little bit? How that? Good. I mean, real real quickly, and and uh, Robert knows also about this. I mean, we shared all of our yeah. information, but what's so important is that after the murder of George Floyd, uh, Trump went kind of, uh, again, one of these examples of a kind of hysterical met mental decline. And he, was wor he wanted to bring in combat troops to Washington to deal with the Black Lives Matter protests. And Secretary of Defense Esper and General Milley said, this is going to be a nightmare. This is going to be exactly what happened in 1968 after the assassination of Martin Luther King. We can't let this happen. And what they did is they checkmated him uh, in a series of very dramatic scenes in the Oval Office. And uh, them, the, the military leaders, uh, stopping Trump from doing something that could have been a catastrophe. And what's central to this is they're, they're not looking out for their interests, they're actually looking out for Trump's interests. Because if we bring combat troops to the, to, uh, the nation's capital, we could have the sort of clash and cataclysm that, exact, that we wanted to avoid, the country wanted to avoid, but of course not Trump because he was angry. So um, as John noted earlier, although it's not mentioned as often, half of the book is devoted to, to Biden and, and his 2020 campaign and ultimate victory. And Biden of course is a longtime political player, but this was a different campaign for him as we learned from your book. Robert, what, what did you discover about Biden's strengths and weaknesses? in your reporting? It was not only about his strength and weaknesses, it was about him being aware of them. And what you see in Biden in the 2017 to 2019 period is a man who's more self-aware perhaps than he was when he ran for president for the first time in 1988, then runs again for a second time in 2008. Those two bids were failures. And when he's thinking about this third bid, it's not so much about Biden being the next Kennedy-esque figure in the Democratic Party. It's about a mission. He tells Ron Klain privately, his future chief of staff in the White House, that Donald Trump is not an American president. He watches Charlottesville with horror and confides in Mike Donilon, his longtime advisor, and others that something must be done to counter Trump. So there was a mission coupled with that usual Biden ambition from the start of his path to the presidency. And you see in terms of his strengths and weaknesses, someone who carved a place for himself, really was ensconced there for decades as the centrist from Delaware, the Amtrak riding, friendly centrist from Delaware, a hawk on foreign policy, socially moderate, 
a Roman Catholic, but this is someone who sees the Democratic Party changing. And while he wants to have his candidacy be rooted in being the anathema to Trump uh, or, or seeing Trump as the total uh, thing that must be opposed, Biden's decision to run uh, ultimately becomes someone who works with the left side of his party. One of the key scenes in the book that hasn't gotten much attention is in April of 2020 when he has a phone call with Senator Elizabeth Warren after her brother Don dies. And he has this conversation about siblings and how important it is for siblings to stick together. And it shows Biden's human touch. That's part of his strength. And it, it also shows him trying to address his weakness. He doesn't have this link to the liberal side, the progressive side of the Democratic Party. So he uses his strength, that human touch, that personal Biden outreach to bolster himself on the left. And that also happens with Senator Bernie Sanders in the book, who instead of fighting Biden all the way to the convention, decides I'm going to work with Biden because I trust him from my time in the Senate. So this Biden story is about power and about Trump, but also about a man recognizing himself politically in a new way. Of course, now we're seeing that Biden is fairly embattled, right? He's, um, you know, his, his ratings have gone down. Uh, you know, uh, Afghanistan certainly didn't didn't help matters. Um, you know, knowing what you know from your reporting, what, what how do you see, you know, the rest of his presidency unfolding? Well, well of course, that we get to watch and. Uh, uh, Costa has a, a sign on his computer, which is you, you, you should tell them, Robert, uh, because it, it's a, assume nothing. And uh, I think that's a really good principle. I've um, learned from Robert about the don't assume anything. And so what's going to happen in the future with Biden? It may be good. It may not work out. It may be bad. What we did find, and this is uh, stunning and detailed, in March of this year, before he decided to withdraw the forces from Afghanistan, he had 25 National Security Council meetings or one-on-one -on -one meetings with key cabinet officers and participants or these small group meetings. And he was determined to get out of Afghanistan. We quote him from 10 years uh, earlier when he was uh, the vice president to Obama and did not like at all the idea of sending more troops to Afghanistan. Uh, in one of these after action reviews, uh, then Vice President Biden says, the military does not F with me. He was determined to take control of the situation, but his top cabinet officers, Secretary of State Blinken, Secretary of, of Defense Austin, go to Europe uh, in March of this year and the Europeans say you have to slow down if you're going to withdraw from Afghanistan, slow that process down. So they formally recommended that. Uh, they changed their mind because because Biden so did we are getting out. So then in April when he announced were withdrawing, it was um, in effect a summary withdrawal. And you see that in the record, which we are able to publish in peril, you see that uh, at one point, one of the intelligence people told the National Security Council and President Biden, uh, and this, this was in March and April, that maybe Afghanistan, if we pull out, will collapse in a matter of months. And of course, that's exactly what happened. So there was a warning here uh, on the table, was not taken. Uh, Afghanistan, uh, uh, you know, who, it is unbelievable. I, I spent last part of uh, the last 20 years since 9-11 on the Afghan story and the U.S. presence there and how we got there and what it meant. And people who are veterans, and there are literally thousands of them, of the Afghan war, are just truly shocked that we now have a situation where the Taliban is in Kabul and ruling 
the country. Robert, I don't know if you have any more to add to that or if you want to talk about it in the context of the Democratic Party and, um, and you know, what, 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 what does the party need to do now in order to really um, um, respond and, and buffer, you know, for, you know, the next election? What we saw at the onset, uh, the beginning of the Biden presidency was this enormous energy to pass the $1.9 trillion rescue plan, that this was going to be how Biden put his stamp on the early months of his presidency, major spending, looking up at FDR on the wall of the Oval Office and saying, this is the kind of presidency I want, working with progressives to be transformational. And he got it done. He had to push Senator Manchin, who was wary of this level of spending around. And we detail that in the book about how Biden, in his own way, is taking that personal approach to legislating. But after the rescue plan passes, there's an interesting moment in our reporting in the book where all the eyes turn now to something beyond spending. While spending and infrastructure have certainly remained front and center in Washington, there's something deeper after the insurrection, in the wake of the insurrection, even months later, beyond the committee itself. There's a feeling in Washington that democracy is under attack, especially in the Democratic Party, though, in some corners of the GOP. In the Democratic Party, people like James Clyburn, the House Majority Whip, whose endorsement all but cemented Biden's victory in South Carolina and perhaps the nomination. Clyburn's wondering privately after the rescue plan passes in the spring of 2021, what is this party going to do, the Democrats, with this majority now in the Senate, albeit narrow, what are they going to do about voting rights? Can they break the filibuster? Because they will see Republicans in the states on the march, passing voting rights laws in Republican legislatures, doing things to get ready for the Republicans in 2022, in 2024. And Clyburn is pushing someone like Manchin, who comes to his office on April 21st of this year, pushing Manchin to break the filibuster so the Democrats can pass voting rights legislation. But that has yet to happen. Manchin has resisted breaking the filibuster to do so. Uh, Clyburn, though, and many other Democrats are worried about what this means for democracy. Clyburn confides to his aides, democracy is on fire. And that sentiment has continued to be pervasive in the party, both in Washington and beyond, because there's a lot of fear now in the Democratic Party when they look at Virginia being a 50-50 race in many respects for the gubernatorial race uh, coming up next month. They look ahead at 2022 and wonder, could Trump come back not only in 2024 and win the Republican nomination, but have an easier way of maybe changing the way the Electoral College counts votes and electors are selected if election laws are changed and Trump allies are installed in all of these positions? And, and that's an unsettling feeling for many Democrats, and it's fueling the debate today. Bob, um, a lot of the questions from participants really um, were asking for context. And um, of course, given your um, role in the Nixon presidency, the question is really, how does the Trump presidency compare to Nixon's last days? And how is it, you know, very different? Well, you know, I mean, one way it compares uh, which surprised uh, Robert Costa and myself. And that is that there was this national security crisis and Chairman Milley, after being uh, directed by Nancy Pelosi, you've got to give us some guarantee that President Trump is not gonna shoot off nuclear weapons. Now remember, this is January 8th, two days after the trauma of the insurrection. Uh, Trump's got only 12 days in office. And so Milley called in and got a pledge uh, from people in the war room that they would not take any orders from, the, from President Trump without including Milley in the room. This is exactly what Secretary of Defense Schlesinger did in 1974 with Nixon and the worries about Nixon's drinking, his depression, his instability. And so a very I mean, almost identical order was put out. So this is the only time we know that this has happened. So this was that extraordinary moment. 
but what what is really truly interesting if, if you'll bear with me for a moment sure. is the difference uh, the different response by the Republican Party now in 2021 versus 1974. Uh, after Nixon resigned, uh, Barry Goldwater, who was the conscience of the Republican Party, uh, had kept a diary and he invited Carl Bernstein and myself up to his apartment in Washington and got out the whiskey and said, I'm going to read my daily dictation. And he got out the dictation from August 7th, 1974, a couple of days after the smoking gun tape was released. And Goldwater recounted a scene in the Oval Office where Nixon called Goldwater Republican leaders from the Senate and the House, and they said, we're going to let Barry speak for us. So Nixon kind of un un always uncomfortable joked and said, well, um, Barry, how many votes will, I know I'm going to be impeached in the House. How many votes will I have in the Senate? 20, which of course would not be enough. He would need 34 under the Constitution to stay in office. So then Goldwater says, to Mr. President, I've counted noses in the Republican Party and uh, you have five votes. And one of them is not mine. I mean, I, I've never really seen the knife slipped in quite so uh, undelicately, particularly in the Oval Office. The next day, Nixon announced he was resigning. Now we see the Republican Party in step, uh, ki kind of in this, this iron curtain of obligation uh, as we call it, uh, to Trump, and that it is a, a world of obedience. Uh, Trump calls, calls the shots. He's unchallenged in public, but it, as Robert and I found in our reporting, so many of the Republican leaders hold Trump in disdain. They do not trust him. They're worried about him. But one thing they can all do, they can count and they can look at the polls and there are tens of millions of people who support Trump. And so there's no challenge. And we now have the reality, think of it, in October, 2021, where Trump is still talking about and running on the allegation of the stolen election from last year, 2020. And of course, no one has produced any evidence that that's the case, but that's exactly what Trump is running on. And people uh, in the party publicly and tens of millions of Republicans support Trump on this. And that is what's called political reality, October, 2021. Thank you for that. Um... So the, the last two words of the book are peril remains. Um, and there's so much, you know, to talk about around this very issue. So General Milley compared the events of January 6th to the 1905 Russian Revolution and other key observers are also suggesting that it was really a dry run that provides a playbook for 2024. In the meantime, Trump is targeting many of the people who, you know, got in the way this time around. So, Robert, what, in fact, can the American public expect in 2024 or in 2022, for that matter? Well, if you just look back at the book, it, it, it portends a lot of possible uh, agony for American democracy, or at least strain in the coming years, because when Donald Trump is defeated in November of 2020. He initially begins a legal strategy and he fights it out in the courts. Giuliani takes control of the legal strategy, but they continue to fail all the way up into the Supreme Court, rejecting the Texas push to have uh, some to have uh, to hear it to hear the case in Texas. And when it all fails in the courts, they then turn to pressuring the Department of Justice and Bill Barr resigns. But so they have an active 
acting attorney general in late December. They turned to the pressuring the vice president, people like Senator Mike Lee and, and other lawmakers on Capitol Hill. There are all these pressure points that are coordinated from the office of the presidency, Donald Trump. He's pushing from the top down to try to make the system work for him. And so the peril remains because there's no one who has documented the presidency better than Woodward. And he understands how, and he's told me about this as we've gone through this project, how much the presidency has grown in power. And it, because it's an expansive institution at this point in American history with, with enormous power, not only on the nuclear front as, uh, uh, nuclear front as Bob has explained, but on the domestic political front, it raises the question for the future about peril. And if someone like Trump or Trump himself wins again, he's not the outsider anymore. He's the insider who fully understands how to use the levers of power and pull them to bend the presidency to his will. And I keep thinking back to Bob's first book for Simon & Schuster on Trump Fear, which came from an interview, that title from an interview we did together of Donald Trump on March 31st, 2016, where he said, real power is, I don't even want to say the word, real power is fear. The beginning of that book is Donald Trump having documents stolen off of the Resolute desk by advisors, people taking documents away from Trump. By the end, by peril, it's Trump with the Eastman memo and other documents, putting documents in the hands of others, fully in control of the presidency. And that man, and those like him could very well come back. See, um, I wanted to, to turn to a little bit just about like a little bit of sausage making, if you will, um, because uh, a lot of people are actually interested in this beyond myself. Um, so, so Bob, you've had many collaborations in the past, most famously with um, Carl Bernstein. And, but in the acknowledgments of Pearl, I, I did go through those, you offer just um, lovely praise for Robert and high praise coming from you where you said, and you've said in the past, yeah, you know, you might do two or three interviews um, a night, a day, and, you know, Robert would do six or seven. Um, can each of you talk about the collaborative process? I mean, how do you divide the interviews and who writes what and who wins when you disagree? <laughs> or is that when John is the arbiter? So um, how did it work? Uh, yeah, John would, uh, John was just the scrupulous reader of uh, the first draft a uh, couple of days after we sent it in we got a, an extensive memo and then uh he said i'd like to get you guys on the phone and go through the first draft page by page <clears throat> we spent three hours doing this you have not lived as a book author unless you have john carp go through your first draft page by page with questions, <laughs> with suggestions, and they all absolutely uh, made sense. We uh, have different sources, different experiences, and we were instantly aware that we had to uh, what we call saturation reporting. We had to look at everything and we're looking back. We're not trying to predict the future. We're trying to say what happened. And that's how we discovered this whole Pence story, which is uh, one of the most dramatic political uh, odysseys that I've ever written or uh, read about and the national security crisis. And so what, what we're doing is, uh, taping all our interviews with the permission of the people doing it on deep background where we make it clear we're going to use all the material, we're going to confirm it, but we are not going to say where it came from. And then we had literally 6,000 pages of transcript. That's roughly 20 books. So we had to reduce it uh, to one book and we had my wife, Elsa Walsh, who was an editor, worked uh, at the Washington Post, was a staff writer for the New Yorker, scrutinized everything. Uh, Claire McMullen, our assistant, transcribed, thought, asked questions, would always be 
kind of the stimulus of, well, wait a minute, you need to go back to this person for a third interview. So it, it, it was a team effort, again, looking back in a way that you rarely get to do, you, you really can't do in daily journalism. Uh, we have the greatest respect and affection for daily journalists. They do amazing work but they have to think, okay, how do I put something together at six o'clock at night? We did not have that pressure. The only pressure we had is, do we fully, or as fully as possible, understand what happened? I would Robert, add, yeah. Yeah, please jump in. I was the one to hear your perspective. Bob Woodward is someone I've worked with and been friend, friends with for, over five, six years now, seven years. But working on this project with him has been such a joy and he's a generous spirit and he's a modest person. So let me just say a couple of things. One, he has immense love for reporting and that was infectious, especially to me after a grind of a presidential campaign and seven, eight years at the post going 24 seven essentially every day as a reporter to step back and to really dig deep into an investigative reporting project and to work with someone who has such dedication to the craft and the method. And one of the early things I noticed about Woodward is that he would read every transcript I did carefully and he would give me constructive feedback and he would welcome constructive feedback to him. And as a professional, putting aside the friendship, as a professional, there's nothing better than that when two people can truly communicate candidly and constructively to each other without having to pull punches or be on your toes. It really yields better reporting and a stronger product at the end. And that was a really beyond the joy of working and collaborating with him, the professional respect he had for my interviews. And he would listen to when I would read his interviews and give him his feedback. It really made it a team effort along with Elsa Walsh his wife, who's, who's brilliant as an editor and thinker and a research assistant, Claire McMullen from Australia. She did excellent work. And of course, Jonathan Karp's eye is unparalleled. And the collaboration, I know it's not new perhaps to Woodward and Karp who do this, the books all the time. But for me as a first time author, co-author, it was uh, really refreshing to see professionalism and the drive to get to what Ben Bradley would tell Woodward is the, the most obtainable version of the truth. So, I mean, I would say, obviously, given the results, um, which is peril, that this is a great collaboration. And um, we, I think I would speak for many people who would love to see more, more of, of it down the pike. So I wanted to um, get to some of the many, many questions that we got from participants across the country, um, just really smart. And a lot of them really, Certain, you'll see certain buckets where people are really interested in certain themes. So Jenna from Harrisburg um, asked, can you talk about the difference in access you had to the two administrations for this book? And did this affect the style which you wrote the Trump chapters versus the Biden ones? And that's it, whoever wants to jump in. Okay, I mean, first of all, we were able to uh, we knew people, we had contacts. I had contacts going back decades in some cases. So did Costa. And uh, we used those. We made it very clear that we're going to listen, we're going to confirm. And so uh, the answer to the question is we had uh, never perfect access, but we were able to get to all of the people one way or another and you, you see in the days after the election, some of the great Trump supporters uh, like Secretary of State Pompeo is telling people, oh my God, uh, Trump is in a dark place. And uh, Pompeo, who was an advocate for some sort of military action against Iran finally gave up and said, uh, I'm not dealing with effing Iran anymore. And the CIA director worried that Trump would strike Iran just out of uh, ego. So uh, one way or another, uh, as they 
Polonius says uh, by indirections are directions found and uh, we were able to do that, I believe. So um, in, in a similar vein, uh, David in Boston, uh, again, a lot of other folks asked this, asked that he wants to know, how is it that Trump kept talking to you after your last two books? And um, for both of you, what was it like? Um, what, is he, what was he like during the interviews with him? Well, I interviewed him for 10 hours, 18 interviews last year for the book Rage about uh, his handling of the COVID-19 virus. And uh, he declined to be interviewed for this book by Costa and myself. But when we said something a uh, day or two ago, he tweeted because what we were saying was uh, Trump is the powerhouse in the Republican Party and have never seen a former president with this political sustaining power. And so he tweets out uh, what uh, was said. And, uh, you know, so, <laughs> but he's still not calling us up and doing interviews. Um, uh, Robert, um, here's uh, Catherine from San Francisco asks, how do we safeguard against this happening again? And how do we erect safety rails to protect our democracy? Well, I appreciate the question. It's not for a reporter to take a public policy position or to even advocate. But I, I was uh, recently speaking to some readers who asked a similar question and they kept pushing me to give them something. And I would offer this, and it, it's not self-serving, but I, I really mean it sincerely. The best thing to do if you're concerned as a citizen is to read more, think more, talk more with your neighbors. Because so one thing I have detected as a reporter when I'm out on the campaign trail is people will say to me, right or left, I can't stand what the other side's doing. I, I, I just can't stand it. It's ruining this country. And I said, well, when's the last time you spoke to them? Oh, well, I, I, I'll comment on their social media. I said, well, maybe pick up the phone or have them for a cup of coffee. I'm not a political person. I'm just a reporter. But one of the things I, I think brings people together as readers is civic knowledge and civility. And a little bit more of that is always welcome. A lot of people are really asking, you know, what's ahead. And so Wendy um, from Savannah asked, where do you see the U.S. government in 2030? Um, historically, how successful have Democratic or Democratic-leaning governments been when threatened with an authoritarian government? And then, you know, we're going, there's some stretches here, but I think the, the key part of the question is, you know, what repercussions might these events, these recent events have on our system um, when you look out? Um, I would just jump in real quickly on that is these subpoenas are very important. This book is cited by the House Committee investigating January 6th. And we're at a crossroads watching this as reporters because they're citing the scenes in our book that put Bannon, Dan Scavino and others, Cash Patel, Mark Meadows in the room with Trump talking through the events and conversations that preceded January 6th. If this committee is not able to compel testimony or find answers, it will raise questions on Capitol Hill about the power of Congress versus perhaps the power of the presidency. Is Congress a diminished institution? Not for me to answer, but it's certainly a question that will be raised on that question of democracy. Can Congress hold people involved in an insurrection accountable at least to answer questions? That will be something that will test Congress in the coming weeks and perhaps in the coming years. Uh, and that's, that's a lingering question for American democracy. If things are pulled, if the threat is pulled, who's accountable and who has to answer for it? And that's not entirely clear at this moment. Um, Marsha from Wisconsin asks, can you talk about what conversations were taking place among family members on January 6th? Uh, we've got some reporting in the book to show that, uh, that Ivanka, uh, the daughter of President Trump, 
was very active to try to calm him down uh, on January 6th. And uh, the scenes depicted there, I, I think she wants to make sure that uh, she is seen as a voice of moderation. Our reporting shows that to be the case. May I, I mean, I, I love these questions about like 2030 and so forth. And they're the I right I, questions. I don't think Bob Woodward likes them actually at all. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like them because I can't answer them. Right. Uh, but, but here's one of the things that might be uh, relevant uh, as we, do this reporting as we finish the book, as uh, John Carp has gone through with, with questions and edits on the, I believe the third or fourth draft, we have to step back and say, have we got it right? And one of the big questions is that we have to ask, and we asked, uh, did General Milley, with all of his worry about China, uh, worry about nuclear weapons, did uh, he overreact? Did he get it right? And I want to tell a personal story because it lives with me. Uh, it goes way back to 1969 when I was in the United States Navy and I was on a ship, a large destroyer guided missile frigate called the USS Fox. And we had a position off the coast of Vietnam as a radar picket ship, uh, ship and air control ship. And it's a Sunday and I am up as the officer of the deck who is the acting captain. And you have the responsibility of 300 people on the ship. There are uh, nuclear weapons aboard. There are lots of secret operations. And so we're going along beautiful Sunday afternoon off the coast of Vietnam in the middle of the war. And a lookout calls out and says, uh, object dead ahead. And so I get my binoculars and I look and the lookout starts saying a floating mine is dead ahead. And I look at this. Now I have to make a decision and this is on a scale of not even one on a 10 Richter scale, but I, it informed me the way somebody like General Milley looks at this. And I'm looking at this floating mind, mine, and I have control, captains off somewhere. And so I order what's a uh, right full rudder emergency. And that the helmsman takes uh, the boat into the, the ship, the very large ship, 300 feet long, into a sharp turn that looks like it's capsizing the ship. And I go to the 1MC, which is the uh, speaker system in the ship and say, captain to the bridge, captain to the bridge. He comes running up what the F are you doing? And uh, I said, there's a floating mine out there. And then they got the Marines up there, the sharpshooters, and they shot at the mine and it exploded. And the captain looked at me and said, maybe you did the right thing. <laughs> Captains on US Navy ships don't apologize, but that's as close. And I, that, that moment when you have to say, I am going to act, maybe I'm overreacting, maybe I'm gonna look uh, not well, uh, but I have to make that decision. General Milley was in the situations about nuclear weapons and possible war with China on a scale, it's not just up to 10 on the Richter scale, it's a 15 and What's his responsibility? Not to protect his image or protect himself, it's to protect the country. And he decided to act. And the experience as a, uh, I think I was 26 years old at that time, lives in my head. You need to act to 
protect. And uh, Costa and I, based on our reporting, believe that's exactly what he did. He's been criticized for it, fine, understand. But um, that is a basis for examining when somebody in a moment, if you will, of peril decides they're going to do something, they are going to act. That's, that's terrific. Um, that's, a, that's a great story, a personal story, and I think very fitting for what, um, to really talk about Millie's role in this whole um, really important moment in our history. Um, I think we have my time for maybe one more question. So Robert, I'm gonna ask you this, and it kind of pivots off some of the conversations we had earlier, which is Alan from New Orleans is asking, you know, in spite of everything, why do you think that Trump still has such strong support in the Republican Party? This is about re revenge. Brad Parscale, his former campaign manager, says privately in the book to others that Trump had an army, an army for Trump. He wants it back. And if he runs again, it will be for vengeance. And we see him on the campaign trail galvanizing his supporters. The election was stolen, he cries, and he uses wartime language uh, that steals the rhetoric of Winston Churchill during the World War II, where he says, we will never surrender. We will never give in. We will always fight. And the people have roared to him in the Republican Party, and they see him as their anti-establishment standard bearer, uh, stoking various grievances across the board, uh, and that has not gone away. His polling shows him more popular than ever because of his faults and his flaws in the eyes of his critics. Uh, people love that he has enemies who they also despise. And we, it just comes through at the end of our book that this is a political figure gaining traction in his own party rather than losing it, but we'll see. As Woodward and I always say, assume nothing, who knows what's next. Well, I guess I can be here another hour um, asking you questions um, because this has been an incredibly fascinating conversation and this is um, a really terrific, terrific work. Thank you both for just a, a really important and enlightening um, book. And I would say um, if you haven't already read it, um, please visit your local bookseller and get a copy of Pearl. And lastly, just a big thank you um, to all of our partner book festivals who um, really helped put this together. Um, thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Robert, um, for joining us this evening. Good night. <laughs>